<clears throat> brethren, a couple of weeks back, we started looking at uh, the necessity of you and I being resurrected. Uh, we saw that uh, the dead, whether they're good dead or bad dead, the dead are indeed dead. <laughs> like Rover, they're dead all over. And unless you're going to be resurrected from the dead, uh, you and I would stay dead. So the saints, I think we saw, will be resurrected from the dead at Jesus' return. It'll be a great harvest, the harvest of the first fruits at the return of the Lord Jesus. And that's the position for the saints. But of course, equally, you do have the wicked to contend with. Now, most people today in most churches, their view, I think by and large, is that the, the good people, like them, uh, goes off to heaven as soon as they're dead. You just immediately float away, an angel's there to take you by the hand and lead you by the direct route or the scenic route into heaven. And of course, for the, the dead who are wicked, the dead who are the unsaved, uh, they go straight away immediately to, to hell, where in many people's minds, they suffer endless conscious torment, burning in terrible hell. Again, as we saw, that's actually not, not biblical. People who die remain dead. The scripture tends to use the expression are asleep because that's you know, a fairly close match to being dead, to being asleep. Whether you're the good dead, a dead saint, dead in Christ, or whether you're uh, unsaved who is dead, you will sleep peacefully in the grave until at some point you are awakened. And the idea that the, the dead wicked go off to burn forever in torment and hell and agony, having you know vats of boiling oil poured over them, flames licking around them, screaming in agony, demons with pitchforks poking them. The, the idea that that's what a, a good, loving God would do has put many people, apparently, off of the Christian religion because they can't see it. Well, how could this be right? How, how could a God who is loving and like Jesus is meek and mild. How could such a God that you tell me about send people into hell to burn and fry forever in agony with no let up for a million, billion, billion years? And some people say, if that's your God, forget him, not interested. And uh, quite honestly, I wouldn't be interested either if that's what God was like. Although if that's what scripture has taught, we'd have to say, well, phew, I guess I have to accept that. That's what the scripture tells me, but thankfully it doesn't. Um, like we saw you know, last week, we looked at a number of scriptures which show that the fate of the wicked is essentially utter, complete destruction. If you just read the language of scripture, not trying to super interpret it, but just read it as it, as it comes, the words that, that uh, the prophets and the writers chose to use, it's fairly consistent. Some of the words we saw last week were, the wicked will vanish away. Gone. They will be like smoke. Again, smoke doesn't tend to stay there. It sort of wafts away and then you don't see it any longer. Uh, they'll burn like stubble or burn up like chaff. There's nothing left. They'll be like ashes, which is, of course, what you get after you burn stubble or chaff or anything. You get ashes. Other scriptures talk about they'll perish. And you might think, oh, what does perish mean? Well, the Greek tells us it means destruction. And you've all seen, you know, pictures of things being destroyed, whether it was the Twin Towers, right, uh, years ago. You've seen the aftermath of an earthquake, maybe a hurricane, a tornado. You know, the, the houses destroyed. There are bits, pieces, they're gone, they're no more. And that's what the scriptures show us to be the fate, the ultimate fate of those who are unsaved, ungodly, wicked, destroyed, vanished away like ashes, burned up. And that's consistent. Let's look at a couple of places from last week, just as a reminder. Uh, first one would be Matthew chapter 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, reading verses 13 and 14, which we were at last week, so just a couple of places, just to sort of a refresh last week's understanding before we move on. Uh, verse 13, Jesus, uh, red letters, talking says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, 
and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. Quite an interesting uh, observation there by the Lord Jesus. The, the broad way, <laughs> the highway where most people are is a way that takes you to, to where? To destruction. And destruction means what it says. You don't have to sort of try and you know, re-engineer it. You're heading to destruction. Think of that earthquake. Think of that tornado. That's destruction. And that's where most people are going. Now, to contrast with where many are going to destruction, the few on the narrow path are going to life. So on the one side, you have life, ultimately forevermore. On the other side, you have destruction, gone, no more, vanished away. And Jesus says that's where most people are headed. They're headed to destruction, right? Uh, look at Second Peter chapter 3. And we saw many, or at least we saw a dozen or so scriptures last week talking of destruction. Destruction, being destroyed, right? That's the language of scripture. Now, of course, most people, unfortunately, and I was the same way when I came into the truth, you already believe certain things before you've ever opened a Bible. That was my case. You know, I'm sure by the time I was nine or ten, I knew about an ever-burning hellfire where wicked people would burn up forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And a terribly bad place called purgatory, <laughs> where people who were sort of goodish, but not quite good enough, would be burning and burning in torment and agony. So eventually in purgatory, you sort of purify yourself and then you come out and go into heaven. But the wicked, and uh, in my view as a nine, ten year old, if you missed mass on Sunday, you were guilty of a mortal sin. And uh, if you died with a mortal sin on your soul, you got off to hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and some more, right? But I believe that. Hell, demons, burning fires, mm -hmm. eternal torment. I was only nine years old, eight years old perhaps, somewhere around there. I'd never opened a Bible, oh, didn't open a Bible that. for another five years yet. <laughs> so like most people, I already had my beliefs up there in my mind, going to heaven, going to hell, burning fires, immortal soul, long before they ever picked up a scripture. And then, of course, the danger is when you read the Bible, you read into it what you actually believe, rather than having a clear mind and reading out of the Bible, right? But for most of us, that's too late. We already sort of warped before we opened the Bible. So Second Peter, we were here last week, but we're going to read just a wee bit uh, more uh, of this passage this week. Second Peter chapter 3, verses uh, 5 through 13, beginning in verse 5. So Peter's talking about the end times. And he's talking about how in the end times there'll be scoffers who will poo-poo the idea of Jesus returning. So we're picking up the context there. Verse 5, For this they willfully forget, these scoffers, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. That's talking of the, the days of Noah. The world that Noah lived in perished, meaning destroyed. It's the same Greek word we're on about. It's destroyed. The world of Noah's day was destroyed, flooded by water. All life died, well, at least all creatures that breathe, you know, animals and human beings all died, were perished, destroyed, gone, right? Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word of God, are reserved, oh, for fire. <laughs> Last time it was water. Next time it's going to be fire. Reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Perdition being another of those words meaning destroyed. The, the, the Greek words are related between perished earlier and I think some translations actually use the, the word destruction here. Talking about the judgment, the day of judgment, and at which point the ungodly men and women will be destroyed. It'll be their perdition, their destruction. But beloved, verse 8, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, his promise to return, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, be destroyed, 
but that all should come to repentance. So the world that then was in Noah's day was destroyed. The day of judgment will destroy all ungodly men. God wants all to repent, otherwise they'll be destroyed. They'll perish. So, I mean, again, the language, if you're not going to try and unravel it and read into it your denominational views, is destruction, just as the world of Noah's day was destroyed. It was no more. Blotted out. And that's the fate of the ungodly, to be blotted out, to be destroyed, to be no more. Let's carry on, reading verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night uh, to the scoffers, not hopefully to you and me, we should be a tad more alert than that, but it will come as a thief in the night to the scoffers in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, get the impression of what's coming, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Obviously, the saints are going to be you know, delivered and rescued, but the rest, the world and the ungodly, burned up in fervent heat. Verse 11, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, <laughs> dissolved away, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Got it? <laughs> Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness you know, dwells. So we should live correctly. We should live right because we know what's coming. But it's talking here. You can see a number of references to blazing heat, burning fires, uh, the cosmos dissolving, right? And the ungodly heading into destruction, to, to perdition. Like John Baptist, remember, he talked about the unquenchable fire that will burn up the wicked, like so much chaff. You know, the language is consistent. Uh, turn to Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. So we're moving on a little bit from last week. Second Thessalonians and chapter 1. We're going to read verses uh, 6 through 10. Uh, the main thing here is just reading the words and just getting the impression, right? Uh, you know, where's all these multiple references to people living on consciously in torment, in agony, the moment they die, if they're wicked? Can't find it. What you do find is endless references to destruction, to ashes, to burning up, right? So Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, it's a very long sentence, so as Paul sometimes does. So apologies to the Apostle Paul. We're cutting into the middle of his sentence. But he's talking about the, the troubles of the brethren who lived in Thessalonica. Uh, they were persecuted. Life was quite difficult. But you know, Paul's bringing out that one day things will be put right. You know, they'll get their justice. So picking up in verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to, rape, to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. They're tribulating you. They're going to get their tribulation in due course. Verse 7. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's the parousia. Jesus coming back with his mighty angels at the end of the age. Verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming back with his mighty angels and in flaming fire will take vengeance on the ungodly. What does fire do, do you think, to human beings? Or chickens or oxen, right? Burns them up. Verse 9. These, the ungodly, the ones that do not obey the gospel, these shall be punished with everlasting, what? Everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints, to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So if you're a believer, you're fine. If you're a believer, a saint, this is the day. If you're the dead in Christ, you'll be resurrected 
up into the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. If you're alive at that time, you'd be changed up into the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus in his power and glory. But if you're on the, uh, the wrong side, you'll be punished, verse 9, with everlasting destruction. Right? Destroyed. Wiped out. Gone. Finished. That's what happens to those who are the wicked. It's not talking here about uh, they'll be uh, punished uh, with uh, endless torment uh, consciously in, in, in hell somewhere. But those words are not in Scripture. Scripture just talks about it's over. If you're wicked at some point in the future, the wicked will be dealt with. And when they're dealt with, they will be no more. They will vanish away. They will be destroyed, right? The language is, is consistent, right? And yet, some people look to a few passages, um, uh, not strong passages, but they'll find a few passages where they say, yeah, but, but I mean, look at this passage here, and this one here, which we'll look at right now, and they'll say things like, well, it talks about eternal punishment. Surely that means it talks about unquenchable fire. That means it lasts forever. They'll talk about, oh, torment. It says torment here. That's, you know, must be, talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth. So for all eternity, they'll weep and gnash with their teeth, right? And ever burning torment and hell. You'll find a few scriptures that sort of, you know, actually don't say any of that, but that's what they read into it. So we'll look at a few of those. One we looked at last week, uh, Matthew chapter 3. If we turn back there. Matthew chapter 3, talking of John the Baptist and uh, his preaching. So Matthew 3, going to read verses uh, 7 through 12. And I think, again, if you just read these verses, passages as, as they read, if you're not looking to read something into them, they're just you know, pretty obvious what it's saying, one would have thought. But clearly, since many people come from a background, a denominational background, or what the parents have taught them, or their Sunday school classes when they were 12, and they already have this concept of the wicked going straight to hell and burning and burning and burning the moment they die, then it's, it's, you can understand and sympathize a bit. You know, most of us had to unlearn quite a bit of uh, error <laughs> before we finally saw, saw the truth. You know, the one that I struggled with probably most was uh, the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost not being the third person of the Blessed Trinity, <laughs> because I was a Catholic, as you know by now, and uh, up until the age of about 15, 16, <laughs> and right about there, and uh, I used to pray specifically to the Holy Ghost. Because I thought, yeah, my, uh, my logic, not very good. But I thought, well, every prays to the Father, we all know that. And a lot of people pray, pray to Jesus, we all know that. But I pray the Holy Ghost is quite lonely. Because not many people pray to the Holy Ghost, so here's my chance to get in, be his favorite, right? So to me, as a so 13, 14-year-old, I prayed more to the Holy Ghost. And when I sort of started reading it, and sort of, not a person? The Holy Ghost is not a person? But... If he is a person and I say he's not a person and just God's power, I'll be guilty of major blasphemy and I'll go in hell and burn forever and ever. So it took me quite a while to get comfortable with the idea <laughs> that the Holy Ghost is not the third person of the Blessed Trinity. <clears throat> right? It took me a number of months to sort of back away from my early beliefs <laughs> from my first few years, right? So I can sympathize with anybody who has a strong belief in what their denomination or their favorite TV evangelist teaches. And then they think, oh, but surely it must be right. You know, brother so-and-so on the TV can't possibly be wrong. Well, actually, of course he can and often is. So anyway, we're gonna read up here John Baptist and just read the language uh, as what it sort of pretty much says. So verses seven through 12. <clears throat> So John's preaching out in the wilderness and uh, verse 7, When he, John Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, oh you bunch of snakes, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, here's uh, his, uh, his instructions, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not think to say for yourselves, uh, we have Abraham as our father, just relying on your lineage. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. 
And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, okay, so pause for a moment. But what was John Baptist saying here? He's not talking about trees, is he? <laughs> not talking about, you know, the sort of the wisdom of forestry in uh, ancient Israel and how you need to chop trees down when they get too big or too wide or whatever. He's talking about people, all right? He's just using trees as an illustration. And he says, bad trees, trees that don't bear fruits, worthy of repentance, for example, guys and gals. The axe is taken to the roots of those trees. They are chopped down and thrown into the fire. But what happens if you throw a tree into a fire? Right, you've probably seen it, or you've seen pictures of it. Yeah, the tree burns up. Might take a long time if it's a big tree, but the tree burns up. After which you've just got, um, well, it's destroyed. You've got ashes, black ashes, gray, white ashes, perhaps a stench of uh, you know burning wood but that's what happens the tree is cut down it's thrown into a fire the fire burns it up it is no more it's vanished away it's ashes simple moving on verse 11 i indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he capital h in my translation talking of jesus who is coming after me is mightier than i whose sandals i am not worthy to carry he will baptize you with the holy spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, gather his wheat, which is valuable, into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. <laughs> he will burn up the chaff. He's not talking again about your barn and brushing out. He's talking about people, those who repent, uh, which the Pharisees and Sadducees had the option in fact, got a warning from John Baptist to repent, right? Bring forth fruits to prove you've repented. Uh, but, says uh, John Baptist, when Jesus comes, he will give you the Holy Spirit or he will burn you up with fire, like chaff. What happens when you burn up chaff with unquenchable fire? Well, it burns up, just ashes, nothing left. And, of course, uh, people who read this, as I think I used to read it when I was... Uh, a younger teenager, I uh, tended to read unquenchable as uh, everlasting. <laughs> <laughs> to me, somehow, because I already believed that, so I believed in eternal hellfire, so when I read unquenchable, I just sort of, you know, twisted the meaning slightly to mean never, ever, ever, ever going out. But unquenchable doesn't mean never, ever, ever goes out. It just means you can't put it out until it's finished, until it's served its purpose, and then obviously it goes out, right? So it just means the fire is so hot that no matter what anybody would try to do, this fire is not going to be stopped. You can't quench it. You can't put it out until it's finished, right? And that's all it says there. But, but equally, what that says is complete, total destruction of those that, that don't repent, right? There's no suggestion there of the wicked are going to live on in terrible conscious torment, in agony forever and ever, billion years from now, still in agony, skin burning off and skin regrowing and burning off again and eyes popping as they burn out and new eyes appearing to pop out next time and demons poking endlessly. There's none of that there, right? It just points to a fire that burns you like a tree or chaff. Gone, right? Let's turn to Matthew 13, one of Jesus' parables. <clears throat> Matthew 13. The parable of the wheat and uh, the tares, the wheat and the chaff, just like John Baptist was talking about, similar type of idea here. So verses uh, 24 to 25 and 30, just to cut into a little bit of the parable itself, 24, 25 and 30. Another parable Jesus put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven, so we're not talking about agriculture, talking about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went on his way. So that's bad news. You get a field with wheat growing and tares growing. And they look similar, apparently, for at least to the early stages before the end you sort of recognize, uh oh, problem. What do you do? Verse 30, uh, the, the master says, let both grow together until the harvest. 
And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, no value, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So the wheat is preserved because it's valuable. The tares are burned up. Okay, but maybe that's just the language of, you know, the, the parable. Maybe the, uh, the ultimate meaning is very different. Well, let's have a look, verses 40 to 43, because the disciples didn't get the message. And so they asked, uh, what was that all about? Verses uh, 40 to 43, so cutting into Jesus' explanation. Verse 40, therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. What happens if you cast a person into a furnace of fire? Right? They don't run around in it for the next million years. They, they die pretty quickly and they burn up fairly quickly. Um, Verse 42, will cast them into the furnace of fire. So there will be a, apparently a furnace of fire, right? There will be wailing and uh, gnashing of teeth, right? And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He was ears to hear, let him hear. So the righteous, we know from this and other places, will live on uh, in joy, uh, eternally, uh, big family. But the others will be cast into the furnace of fire, but it says there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, right? Which I think hints that uh, there will be a, at least a, a period of time for these people to contemplate their imminent future and to realize the consequences they're about to experience of their previous lives and choices, right? So it's not, it doesn't appear to be instantaneous. You're sort of just instantly evaporated, right? These people have some time. Now, we said last week, uh, you know, wailing, weeping and wailing suggests uh, sorrow. Uh, you're lamenting. And so what I think you're seeing here is that these people, as they face their imminent, utter destruction, can, can now see what they're missing. They can now understand and grasp the future they could have had, but they didn't choose for whatever reasons, right? And now they're desperately sorrowful, they're in tears, it's grief, uh, they're lamenting, wailing and weeping. That's the one sort of group of people, the other lot, are, are angry. The gnashing of teeth pictures anger, you know, bitterness. So these people can, can see that their imminent destruction is headed their way, but they're, they're not so much sorry as downright angry, bitter. How could God do this, right? Why should I have to follow God's ways? So they're angry and bitter and hostile and they go to their utter destruction in a terrible attitude, gnashing their teeth. If they could get God, you know, they'd give him one or two, right? But the, the, the fact of this weeping and gnashing of teeth suggests there's a, a period of recognition of what they're facing and what they could perhaps have done about it. So it's not, I think, instantaneous. There's time to realize and think through and realize with horror, oh, I'm going to be obliterated, annihilated forever. If only I'd listened to, or maybe you're angry at your pastor for telling you some nonsense stories, right? Either way, I think there's a period of time here. Your death is not immediate and instantaneous. I think you can see that if you look to, or turn to Luke chapter 12. Look at Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> it's not super clear, but I think uh, there's a strong indication here. Uh, so Luke chapter 12, verses 45 to 48. Another parable that Jesus is, uh, is teaching. Luke 12 and 45, so we're cutting into the parable a little bit. But Jesus says, If that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk. Right? It's a terrible servant. 
His master's left him the responsibility of looking after other servants, looking after the household. Uh, this particular head servant is gone off on a binge, uh, not caring, completely wild, not interested, forgot all about his master's return. Verse 46, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him. And in an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. So the, the this head servant ends up with the unbelievers. Verse 47. But Jesus makes a distinction between two types of bad servant. That servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes because he knew what he should be doing. He was totally aware of his instructions. He absolutely understood. But he said, get lost. And he just lived the way he wanted to. That one, it will be punished with many stripes. Verse 48. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. To whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. So Jesus appears to distinguish between the, the guy who really knew he was doing wrong, many stripes, the guy who did wrong but wasn't fully aware of all the details, will be punished, but few stripes. So it looks like the punishment, in a sense, you know, fits the crime. Other translations talk about not so much stripes, but well, I think one translation says the guy who knew fully but couldn't care, <laughs> but his master will receive a severe beating. The one who didn't know but did things which were really bad will receive a lighter beating, right? So the point I'm just making there is that when you face, not you personally, hopefully, <laughs> but when people, the wicked, the ungodly, face their destruction, uh, I think we have to allow for the fact uh, not everybody's going to get destroyed quite the same way. <laughs> uh, the, the outcome will be the same, but it might be the duration is different. I'm speculating here a little bit. Those who are really, really evil, completely evil. I'm thinking maybe the Adolf Hitlers, uh, Stalins, the Pol Pots, the Mao Zedongs. Perhaps people are really evil, uh, the torturers and the Nazi death camps, the Jeffrey Dahmers. Perhaps people are really utterly evil, vicious, are going to receive a longer duration to weep, wail and gnash their teeth. Perhaps those who were completely wicked but not as bad might receive a shorter duration of trouble. Or so I can't quite explain all the details there because I don't know them. But I can just see that Jesus says many stripes to that person, few to that person. But the ultimate is after that duration is over, after their weeping and wailing is over, after the gnashing of teeth is over, the end result is the same. They're destroyed. They've vanished away. They're burned up in the fires, right? What they're not doing is weeping and gnashing. And this, of course, is the way some people read it. Weeping and, and wailing and gnashing the teeth for eternity. <laughs> no, they're not. They're weeping and wailing, gnashing their teeth in that period up to their annihilation. Right? That's all it says. Because we're talking of fire. Furnace of fire. Burning up in fire. Being destroyed in fire. But between your sentence and your ultimate destruction, there'll be a period of, I don't know, uh, 10 minutes, uh, an hour. Half a day or a week? I don't know, right? But some will receive more um, unpleasantness, put it that way, than others. But at the end of the unpleasantness, the time they've got to sort of realise and figure out all the mistakes they made and why they are stupid, why they didn't do this rather than that, after that time is over, all of them are in the same place, ashes, destroyed. Okay, let's look at Matthew 25, another uh, place where people turn to to sort of try and pull out this eternal punishment business by which they mean consciously tormented forever and ever and ever which would be terrible if it was true uh, thankfully it's not but Matthew 25 and verses uh, 41 to 46 so again another parable from Jesus a parable of the sheep and the goats so when Jesus returns sets up his kingdom sheep over here which is good goats over here which isn't good so we cut into the parable, verses 41 through 46, looking at the, the fate of the wicked. Right, really figured the fate of the saints to be resurrected at, at Jesus' parousia. But for the other lot, 
verse 41. Then Jesus, or the Son of Man, will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Oh, everlasting fire. Well, actually, of course, that doesn't mean much at all, because uh, if a fire was to last everlasting and you're a human being thrown into it, it's uh, adios and goodbye. <laughs> you wouldn't last as long as the fire lasts, even if it was an everlasting fire, right? That says nothing at all about, about your fate. <laughs> if you're thrown into any fire today, if you're in a house today that catches fire, right, you won't live in it for very long, right? But anyway, moving on. Um, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's who it's primarily aimed at, not, not human beings. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. So you're pretty useless. Verse 44. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then the Son of Man will answer to them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these, the goats, will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So on the one hand, eternal life, on the other hand, something called eternal punishment. Now, you know, people sort of read this, and again, because they've got the preconceived idea that burning in hell forever consciously, they sort of tend to read that, but it doesn't say that. Right? It talks of uh, verse 41, the everlasting fire, which is not for human beings. It's going to be used to dispose of the wicked, but the everlasting fire is actually for the devil and his angels, right? But everlasting fire, does that mean the fire lasts for all eternity? A billion years from now it's still burning and a hundred billion years from now it's still burning? Almost certainly not. Because the the, uh, the English uh, everlasting fire comes obviously from the Greek. And uh, the Greek means a fire that lasts for a particular age. It's an age-lasting fire. The age could be, well, a, a good choice might be, say, a thousand years. A millennial age. So it's actually the age-lasting fire. A couple of translations bring that out. They're, they're not particularly common translations, but the Rotherham Emphasized Bible <clears throat> actually translates this as the age abiding fire. Age coming from the Greek A-I-O-N, Ion, or you can pronounce it Eon perhaps, right? So the fire that is destined to burn for an age, that age could be a month, uh, 10 years, space age, industrial revolution age, computer age, Perhaps the millennium stands out as a quite a likely age. And uh, the concordant version talks of uh, the fire Eonian. It's a slightly strange word. Uh, Eon is, is just the English translation from Aeon, Eon. You can talk of people living you know, eons ago. And uh, so the fire Eonian is an attempt to say the fire that lasts for an eon, an age. And I, I suspect, looking at other places, that uh, this particular fire will burn all the way through the millennium and slightly beyond that. That's just my speculation. If I had a chicken, I'd squeeze them at this point. But I, I think I think this everlasting fire, this age-lasting fire, probably lasts through the millennium and for a little bit afterwards until its purpose is, is you know, met. Verse 46, it talks about... Um, these goats, these wicked, will go into everlasting punishment. Well, that's not everlasting punishing. I know some people don't like playing with the punishment and the punishing, but it's actually quite valid. They are punished eternally, right? The punishment they receive lasts forever. They are destroyed forever. There's no way back. There is no way to reverse it. This is our... <laughs> Speculative chicken, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who agrees that uh, it's quite likely that the everlasting fire lasts through the millennium and a bit beyond. But not much beyond that, I think. He's glad to be back. Mm, he's glad to be back, yeah. So <laughs> everlasting punishment means uh, punishment whose effects are everlasting. Once you're destroyed uh, in the lake of fire, once you meet the second death, you're not coming back. 
You've been punished. You've been destroyed. You've vanished away. You've been ashes. You're gone. There is no way back. Your punishment is everlasting, right? Um, but it doesn't mean you're still alive, <laughs> endlessly tormented. You know, the righteous go to eternal life. The wicked, phew, over. And no way back, right? I mean, if you throw anybody into the fire, I mean, a lot of people today get cremated. You know, once they die, their families have them cremated, right? Well, that's putting a body into a fire, into a furnace of fire. And I think if you ask uh, the people that run, you know, crematoria, they'll tell you that uh, it takes about 90 minutes to two hours Whoa. to completely burn up a human body. Uh, they're quite hot, of course, uh, these, uh, these uh, furnaces they use, these ovens they use, right? Mm. But a couple of hours, so you throw anybody into an everlasting fire, and if, if they're alive and they're thrown in, they'll be dead within, I guess, uh, you know, a minute or two or three or four, horribly. And then, of course, uh, two hours later, they're ashes. So even if you have an everlasting fire, it doesn't mean <laughs> you'll live long in it, right? Um, Let's turn to Jude and read verses 5 through 7. So the very short book of Jude, only one chapter. Just before the book of Revelation, if you're struggling. So Jude, verses 5 through to 7. And Jude, of course, is warning the, the church of the day to get back to the faith once delivered because of all the... You know, apostasy and, uh, and deception is there. And he says, verse 5, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Don't, don't be complacent here. Just because you've been delivered doesn't mean you're going to arrive. Because all these people left Egypt delivered miraculously, but only Joshua and Caleb and the youngsters actually arrived in the promised land, right? So just because you're, you know, invited to head to the promised land doesn't mean you're going to get there. You need to pay attention. You know, strive to get back to the faith once delivered is what he's saying. Verse 6, And the angels, who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains until, sorry, under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As, this is where we're going to focus for a moment, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Okay, Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened to them? Well, God rained down fire and brimstone. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> they were destroyed. Right? There was nothing left. You know, Lot and his two daughters had scampered off. His wife looked behind and, and she was unfortunately sort of left there. Right? But Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. And that's the lesson that Jude is saying is get back to the faith once delivered or you'll be like those who died when they left Egypt or the, uh, the uh, everlasting angels because they've got a slightly different future. But like Sodom and Gomorrah, who notice at the end of uh, verse 7, suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. Right? Um, that's the same Greek word as we read in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats into the everlasting fire. It says eternal fire here, but same Greek, right? So this is the same term. And Sodom and Gomorrah suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. The fire's not still burning in Sodom and Gomorrah. You can't go over there now and see flames licking up smoke into the distance. The fire went out a long time ago. I don't know how long it burned. Um, you know, fire and brimstone came down out of heaven uh, on these cities, or towns, wherever they were, and it, it might have burned for a day or two, it might have burned for a week, I'm not sure. But eventually it burned up the cities and that's them completely destroyed. They are uh, ashes. The people are ashes, right? They're not burning today. People start, aren't jumping around in flames and fire in Southern Gomorrah, suffering eternal fire. The eternal fire is commenting really on the the impact, it's destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah forever. And they're not coming back, right? So that's a good illustration. Uh, that's what Jude means is you can see what eternal fire looks like by looking at Sodom and Gomorrah. They're completely destroyed, right? 
And that's the fate of the wicked, is what Jude's saying, to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Not living endlessly in flames that burn for eternity, but to be completely destroyed. That's the vengeance of eternal fire. Look at Second Peter chapter 2, which covers uh, some of the same territory. 2 Peter chapter 2. No surprise, uh, you know, the, the language of Scripture is, is really quite sort of consistent. You can say it different ways, you know, burn up, vanish away, uh, melt like wax before the fire, uh, melt like a snail, <laughs> rather picturesque one, um, perish, be destroyed, uh, be ashes under the feet, right? They're all similar ways of expression, the same thing. Finished, gone, no more. Right? So here in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, Peter says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, an entirely different hell here, this is the Greek word Tartarus, cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, you know, one day, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So God takes care of angels. He took care of the pre-flood world and destroyed it. Completely destroyed it. Verse 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. If you're tempted to live ungodly, says God, look at Sodom and Gomorrah, because that's what happens to the ungodly. The destruction, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is a lesson, an example to the ungodly. And what's the example? Complete destruction. In fact, the word there, uh, destruction, uh, in what is it, verse 6, think of the King James, it's an overthrow, but the Greek word is catastrophe, with a K at the front, catastrophe. You don't need to be a Greek scholar to know what catastrophe means, right? <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah uh, suffered catastrophic damage. And it says also, verse 6, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Fire, brimstone, catas catastrophic destruction, ashes. And that's the lesson to the ungodly. That's your fate. That's your future. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So again, there's no hint here of ever-burning torment. Uh, look at Mark chapter 9. We turn to Mark chapter 9. And I'm going to read verses uh, 42 to 48. Mark uh, 9. Jesus is uh, teaching and he says, uh, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and they were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Not, not literally. <laughs> but certainly Jesus is making a strong comment here about if you're tempted to sin in some particular way, you know, uh, take action. Take strong action. Don't just play at it. So Jesus does not mean, you know, get a machete and chop your hand off if it causes you to sin. It's just an illustration, right? Don't read too much into that. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Ooh. So Jesus says, if you don't deal with your sins, you may end up being thrown into hell, into the fire that will never be quenched. Now, the word hell there is in the Greek Gehenna. You probably recognize that. It's quite a well-known uh, you know, term for people that read their Bibles, Gehenna, Gehenna fire, right? Let's carry on, verse 45. If your foot causes you to sin, because you walk with your feet <laughs> to places you shouldn't be, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into Gehenna, into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die. Mm, immortal worms, eh? where the worm does not die and the yeah. fire is not quenched. Verse 47, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Again, <laughs> illustrating the importance of dealing with your weakness, not 
actually plucking your eye out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, Gehenna fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Right? So here's Jesus talking about uh, the wicked, the, the ungodly, um, may end up in this place called Gehenna, into the fire that will not be quenched. So what was Jesus on about here? For some people, this is it. Jesus is talking about eternal torment forever and ever and ever, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth for all time in Gehenna fire. Um, well, no, that's actually not the case at all. Uh, Gehenna is a, is a Greek term, I guess, from the, uh, the expression would be the Valley of Hinnom. Originally, Gehenna was known as the Valley. I think the, the G, G, the G, E, the G, Henna, is the G is the Valley, the Valley of Henna or Hinnom, right? And uh, that's a small valley uh, in the vicinity of Jerusalem, right near the center of Jerusalem, the Valley of Gehenna, right? The Valley of Hinnom. And it's got a bit of history sort of to it. We've got some slides we'll show you in just a minute or two. But essentially, uh, it's been a famous or rather infamous place <laughs> to the Jews for, for centuries. Because back in Old Testament times, the days of ancient Judah, before they were taken into captivity, they used to worship to foreign gods in the valley of Hinnom. And one particular god they worshipped there was the god Molech. And they used to offer their children and fiery sacrifices to the god Molech, right? Terrible. I mean, God's people offering up their baby sons and daughters in fire to an evil god in the Valley of Hinnom. So it was a terrible place. You know, God hated what happened there. It was an abomination. In Jesus' day, which is more relevant here, the Valley of Hinnom had become a rubbish dump, a refuse dump where the, the, the rubbish, uh, the waste material, uh, dead bodies of criminals in particular, other uncertain bodies thrown there, and there were fires burning because it was a rubbish dump. You know, it was a city rubbish dump, a refuse dump. And uh, so fires burned there as they tried to burn off, you know, all the waste material. So you can imagine the smoke there, there's a stench where the, where the, the, the dead bodies are, where the dead dogs and cats are where the dead donkeys are, where the dead criminals are, uh, where there's decaying meat and other material, there's flies and maggots, the stench, deer, the smoke wafting. It's a place that had an evil connotation from the days of, you know, idolatry. It was a terrible place in Jesus' day. A lot of the Jews were very fastidious, you know, super clean, wash your hands carefully. The idea of this dump just there, horrible, right? Uh, today it's still there, but today it's actually a pleasant uh, little sort of park and Jesus was using it you know essentially as a, as, a, as a symbol this is a sort of place that uh, you're going to go a place of decay and death and destruction an appalling place I think we'll look at our pictures now I think we've got three coming up the first one Malek? yeah is uh, Molech so this is obviously not a pic not a photograph <laughs> <laughs> this is way back in the days of ancient Judea but they've got that like, a horrible looking uh, god Molech and uh, the, the, the people are offering their baby sons and daughters to the god Molech in fire. I think you might see there's some drums uh, there. They used to bang the drums, apparently, to sort of cover up the noise of the babies screaming. So that, that's what God witnessed in the Valley of Hinnom. Terrible, an abomination in his sight. Then in, in Jesus' day, this is not a picture of Jesus' day either, <laughs> but it's a picture of, you've probably seen these, if you go past some, some dumps occasionally, some refuse dumps. Somehow you've got to get rid of all the decaying material, the junk, the wood, uh, the waste remains, uh, the meat, uh, the, the household refuse. So fires are burning, the smoke there. If the wind blows in your direction, the stench will blow you over. So that's what Jesus had in mind. And then today, that's it. Today, uh, it's a lovely little park inside, uh, just outside uh, the, the old city of Jerusalem. You know, I've been there with my wife. Uh, we went to the feast in Jerusalem many years ago. So I can say, quite honestly, I've been through hell with my wife <laughs> because I've been through that valley, <laughs> that park shy, shy with my wife. <laughs> my wife says she could say the same about me. She's been through hell with me. <laughs> so the, the point basically is that, you know, Jesus is simply using uh, a very real illustration. The only person who talked of Gehenna was Jesus. And in the book of James, once Jesus' half-brother mentions it in passing about, about the tongue 
how you use your mouth. But in terms of the fate of the wicked, only Jesus talks of Gehenna. And he talks about it in the vicinity of Jerusalem because it was, it was quite a good illustration, but it's a symbol. It's not, not literal. You know, at the end of the age, all the wicked people will not be brought to a small valley in Jerusalem to be burned up in the little valley. It's a symbol. It's a picture. And it says there, um, you know, three times, well, to, the fire's not quenched. We've covered that. The fire's not going to be quenched until it's served its purpose. But it talks about their worm does not die, right? Verse 44, their worm does not die. Uh, verse 46, their worm does not die. Verse 48, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Uh, some people, would you believe it, say that, yeah, <laughs> in this ever-burning torment in hell that doesn't exist, and the worms will eat at you for all eternity because they're immortal worms. Well, they're not immortal <laughs> worms. I mean, just being silly, aren't we? Um, this is talking about the fate of the wicked. In, in my New King James Version, uh, verse 44 is in italics. Verse 46 is in italics. Verse 48 is in italics. Don't, probably can't see that. I don't imagine. But just, just there. What the translators have done is they've put it in a separate little space on its own. And it's in italics because they're showing you that this is a quotation from the Old Testament. So Jesus is talking of this rubbish dump here, burning and stinking and fires and dead bodies, an awful place to contemplate, especially if you're a Jew. And then Jesus refers back to Isaiah because Jesus often quotes the Old Testament when it's relevant to the point he's making. So let's look at where Jesus is referring, which is Isaiah 66, the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 66. So Jesus is not talking of immortal worms. Uh, as honestly, some people believe that. It's just not, not nonsense. Um, so Jesus is talking about this, the fate of the wicked. If you're ungodly, you're going to end up in a terrible ending to your, to your life. You could have gone on to live forever and with uh, the family of God enjoying glory, but you're going to end up in a terribly awful ending, right? In, in fires, the Gehenna fires, good example of that. It will be a fire. But here in verses 22 to 24, Isaiah 66, so God's talking here. This is uh, quoting Jehovah God. He says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. That's not happened up till now, but looking into the future, the days will come when from Sabbath to Sabbath and new moon to new moon, all flesh shall come to worship uh, God. This is for the good people. Verse 24, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die, their fire is not quenched, they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So God's talking to the saints and says, you'll go out and look at the, at the what? At the people jumping up and down and flames suffering torment and being you know, chewed up by immortal maggots. No, they'll go forth and look at the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, the ungodly. For their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. It's a bit like um, you can probably imagine after a you know, battle in olden days, it might be 10,000 dead soldiers in a field in the fields or 100,000 perhaps, right? And the people in the nearby city would go out after the battle's over and there's dead bodies everywhere. You look at them. And, uh, and of course, the, the birds are there, the carrion crows and so on, pecking away at the flesh. There'd be maggots and flies everywhere. Uh, in some cases, the, the locals would try and you know, bury some of the dead, but so it's a big job, isn't it? Other times, they just drag the bodies together, pile them up, throw wood on them and the big fires burning to try and burn up. And of course, the stench of burning human flesh, dead horses burning. Uh, you know, it's a terrible uh, thing to look at. Um, Thankfully, I've never seen it, but that's the picture that God's got here. The, the saints shall go and look on the corpses, the dead bodies of the ungodly. Their worm does not die because the maggots just live there happily until, <laughs> until they're sated. Then they fly off as flies and lay other eggs and so on. The fire's not quenched because you're not going to put it out until you've dealt with all that, that mess out there. Uh, and it'll be an abhorrence. It's a disgusting thing, right? 
And when Jesus is talking about the fate of the wicked, you know, what, what better picture to use than the picture from Isaiah, which talks of what? Utter, abominable destruction, right? Not talking about eternal life in, 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 in hell with immortal maggots that never stop eating you alive for the next hundred billion billion years. It's a nice, well, it's not a nice picture. <laughs> I think it's an effective picture, right? It's an effective picture from, from Isaiah of the fate of the wicked and they're likened to corpses. So if you look at scripture, wherever you look, even the sort of passages that people sometimes point to, it's all pretty consistent. It's destruction. Uh, and that's, we've covered this before. When a mortal human being dies, they're dead. Whether you're good or bad, you're dead. Nobody goes immediately to heaven. Nobody goes immediately to whatever else there is. Hell, Gehenna, Sheol, whatever, right? And the saints will be resurrected and will have to be resurrected. If you're not resurrected, you'll just sleep forever. But the saints will be resurrected back to life at Jesus' return. That's the harvest. The rest of mankind who are not the saints uh, mostly will be resurrected to physical life and given you know, their opportunity, a real genuine opportunity to go God's ways. If they remain unrepentant, if they remain ungodly, if they don't want to know after God gives them that wonderful opportunity, then their fate is annihilation. The language is vanish away, be like smoke, melt like wax before the fire, burn in unquenchable fire, be ashes under the feet of the saints. Or several times it talks about utter destruction, right? And that's, that's consistent throughout the Bible. The fate of the wicked is utter, complete destruction, annihilation, no more, as if they'd never been. But wait, what about Revelation 14? Let's close here for the day. Revelation 14, because you know I'm skipping the difficult verse naturally. <laughs> I'll just look at the easy ones and I cover those and then I'll just um, you know, leave the subject and walk away. But uh, there is uh, one, or two, one or two verses yeah. that you think, oh, well, I'm sick. Mm, well, that's, that's odd. Okay, let's close today. Explanation to follow. Uh, Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. So we've got here, uh, this part of Revelation, chapter 14, the, the, the message of the three angels. So if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, which you probably aren't, but if you were, it had been, you know, the, the, as far as the Seventh-day Adventists are concerned, their, their mission is to, uh, to promote the messages of the three angels, right? So the third angel, verse 9, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be, oh, oh he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. <gasps> Tormented, fire and brimstone. Verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast on his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Aha, Jamie, the wicked are tormented in flames forever and ever and have no rest. Answer that if you can. Well, we'll try, but that will be, of course, uh, next week. So with that, we'll close today's Bible study.